Yes, we are recording. Ladies and gentlemen, Kathleen Dotty, Romy Jackson are here from University Title. Uh, I brought them on. Uh, one, it's a little bit selfish, I'm not going to lie, um, because Hillary and I have been talking this year. If you were around for the goals one, we've been talking about getting our CCIM this year. And I know just enough in commercial to be dangerous um, and probably hurt myself. So I wanted to learn more about commercial. And uh, Kathleen, actually, uh, we've been kind of quasi friends for probably the better part of a year now, but I don't think we've ever officially met face to face, which is odd. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I've known her for a while. She works at University Title and Romy is also the vice president of the commercial division of this, if, that, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we've got some people that do commercial and they know commercial. And I said, you know what my agents need and I need, because it's a little bit selfish, is uh, we need a little bit of a better foundation on commercial. Uh, I don't do a lot of it. I don't know it. I don't pretend to know it. Uh, so that's why I brought you guys here. So hopefully you can educate us. So if y'all want to introduce yourselves, uh, I'll start ladies first. Kathleen, a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Hey guys, I'm Kathleen Doty. I am a business development here at University Title. Um, I was hired for to, uh, to join Romy and the commercial services team. I also do business development for residential. Um, but yeah, so I, I come from um, just a long background of, I was telling Colin, my dad is a real estate broker down in Corpus, 48 years. So I kind of grew up in this world. Um, I have lending experience. I have, uh, I was two years with a lender here in town. Um, and then this opportunity came up um, and I've just, it's just been exciting. And I get to work with Romy every day. You can't see him, but he's one handsome fellow and he's my work husband. So he and I are getting out in the community and reaching out to uh, commercial folks. And um, I've joined Crew, which is Commercial Real Estate Women. Um, and we are just getting University Title's name out there. Just a quick snippet, University Title has been around for 50 years. We are based out of College Station, Texas. Uh, about four or five years ago, Investor's Title out of Chapel Hill, uh, North Carolina, bought university title, sat and watched, saw the revenue they were bringing into Brazos County and said, you know what, it's time to expand. So that at that point, the last four or five years, we are now in um, a DFW, uh, Houston, Woodlands, and we've celebrated our one year mark here in San Antonio. Our first goal, uh, and this was before I joined on, but the first goal of our company was to start with residential um, and get that up and running, which we did. And then step two was to hit the ground running with commercial. And we have, um, you know, we have seven closers, but I'd say of the seven, we've got four really strong commercial closers here under the guidance of Romy Jackson, who is our VP of commercial services. Um, and he and I are just, you know, a, a team and we're thrilled to be here. Thank you for having us. And I'll, I'll let, I'll pass the baton to Romy. Romy, uh, thank tell us you. about yourself. <clears throat> Well, I've been uh, in the title insurance business since 1974. I started off in mortgage banking in 72 when I got out of the service. Didn't care for that, so got in the title insurance business. Uh, worked my way up uh, through various companies. And finally, in 97, I figured out that what I really like to do the most, and really my highest and best use, is close commercial transactions. So that's what I've done uh, pretty much exclusively since 97. Uh, everything from uh, $200,000 vacant commercial lot to, uh, I think my largest closing was $350 million, and it was a three apartment package in Travis County. Uh, so have kind of seen all of it over the years. Uh, my wife is an escrow officer at a competing title company, and every Ooh. day she uh, comes home and she closes a lot of residential. She comes home to tell me about her residential closings. And I just sit back and grin and say, man, I'm sure glad I'm doing commercial. It's just a, for me, it's just a whole lot more fun. Uh, what we kind of thought about doing was, uh, again, not knowing everybody's ex experience level was discussing the differences that, that I've seen over the years, the basic differences between commercial and, and residential. So I'm going to kind of start down that path, Colin. Uh, but if you have a question, or if you want me to veer off that, no, path, I I love say. it. Like I def that's definitely where I want to start. Uh, but okay. before we go there, um, I do have to ask, like, 
why why do you giggle about the the differences between commercial and residential? I think I know the answer, but I, I am curious, and I want everybody to hear the difference and why what why your life's a little bit easier. Uh, I, I'll tell you the story she told me last night when she got home, pulling her hair out and having her first or maybe second glass of wine. Good girl. She, she had a residential transaction, and uh, we had a. She had a deceased spouse. We got a surviving wife, three children, uh, one of the kids from a prior marriage. And my wife has been asking, particularly the listing broker all the way along now, you know, you've got to get all three kids and the surviving spouse to come in and close. Oh, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And, and this went on for 10 days. You know, you've got to have them all physically present to close or at least sign up with a notary. Oh, yes, yes, we know, we know that. They were scheduled to close today. Yesterday, when she started trying to schedule these four folks to come in, uh, she found out one of the kids, one of the three kids said, well, my, my real mother, who was the first wife, is going to sign for my brother. And my wife said, well, does she have power of attorney? He said, no, she is his guardian. And Kathy said, is this a legal guardian? Yeah, she's a legal guardian. She had the guardianship set up years ago. He's, he's incompetent. He's not able to handle business himself. This is the day before closing. <clears throat> oh, and by the way, a new roof was put on in October, and the roof has been pounding on my wife to want to know, when is this going to close so I get paid? October to now. Well, since we've got a guardianship, since she has a guardianship that now she's dealing with this uh, guardian who is taking care of this child is going to have to go to the probate court. She's going to have to hire an attorney to go to the probate court to tell the probate judge why it's in the child's best interest for her to sell the deceased father's interest in the property and receive the money. Well, now the judge probably is not going to argue with that at all, but it takes six weeks. And it's uh, going to cost about $2,000 in court costs and attorney fees. So that doesn't happen on commercial. You don't get those kind of surprises. Typically, uh, typically, you've got sophisticated investors who clearly understand a real estate transaction. On the larger transactions, typically, you've got uh, the principals have competent Texas real estate attorneys uh and everybody just just understands what the transaction is 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 all about now i want to i want to point this out first i'm a title insurance guy i bought and sold property for myself as a as a as a interested party but i've never acted as a licensed real estate agent earning a commission on a real estate transaction so i've not walked a mile in your shoes uh and i don't want anything to sound like I'm trying to tell y'all how to take care of your commercial business. I just want to share observations that I've seen over the years and share some uh, information that may be helpful, helpful to you. And you're also going to hear me say typical and typically a lot because I've learned not to say always when it comes to a residential or to any kind of transaction, commercial or residential. So if you're typical or typically, if you get tired of it, there's, there's a reason for it. Take a shot every time he says it. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be a, it'll be a great drinking game for y'all. It, it won't be for me so much. So uh, first example, there's seldom, if any, any emotion displayed on a commercial transaction. I've had one fist fight in my closing office over the last 48 years. <laughs> And it was six kids fighting over the estate of their deceased parents, $52,000 piece of property. Two of the sisters got into a literal fist fight. I've not even had harsh conversations, been either participated in or listened to harsh conversations between commercial principals or their attorneys. It's just a business deal. There are no emotions. It either makes sense or it doesn't. Uh, I used to close a commercial investor out of California named Terry Looney. And we were talking one day, this is 20 years ago. And I said, Terry, how do you find these real estate deals? He said, Romy, a commercial real estate deal is like a bus. One comes along every 15 minutes. You pick the one that's right for you. 
And that's how he approached his business. And I think that's how a lot of the commercial investors approach their business. They pick the bus that's right for them, for their purposes. So usually they're sophisticated. Usually they know what they're doing. Usually they know what is expected, expected of them. And usually they're going to be represented by competent Texas real estate counsel, competent Texas attorneys. Now, I say Texas because if you have an, uh, an investor coming in from California, for example, who's been very active in the California market, spent the last 25, 30 years doing nothing but flipping commercial properties, holding commercial properties, whatever it may be, they're going to be well versed in California real estate law. And the difference between California, California real estate law and Texas real estate law is the difference between a dog and a cat. They all have four legs. They all have fur, but they're not the same animal. So if you wind up in a situation where, Colin, if you've got a uh, California investor coming in to acquire some commercial property in Texas, it may not be a bad idea for you to have in your back pocket the names of three competent real estate attorneys licensed in Texas. Because what we don't want to have, what, what I've seen happen that is not very good sometimes is an out-of-state investor comes in and they understand they need competent Texas counsel, but they wind up with either an attorney who's a very good tax attorney who understands the federal tax laws very well, or they may be a... Uh, personal injury attorney. Maybe we've seen them on TV. Maybe the phone number has got a lot of fours in it. The Texas hammer. The, or could, could be a guy who carries a big hammer around. And <clears throat> I'm sure those folks are very competent at what they do, but their level of expertise regarding Texas real estate law may not be what is going to be in the best interest to the principal or to the transaction. So that's the first thing I think, Colin, that I would share with you is if if uh, if you're going to get in the commercial business, and I certainly encourage you to do so, uh, get some relationships, and they don't have to be deep relationships, but get some at least phone call relationships set up with some folks, particularly real estate attorneys, that you may get recommended by me or by Kathleen or by some uh, someone else you do some business with. And to reach out to them and say, look, I may have a need for a, a, a real estate attorney on a coming up, oncoming, upcoming commercial transaction. I just want to know if you might be interested in taking on a new client throughout of California, whatever the case may be. So that I think might be one of the uh, very important things that you that you might want to do. Uh, typically on a commercial transaction, we don't see the buyers. We don't see the sellers. It's often done by email and by FedEx. Uh, sit down face-to-face -face closing like you often have on a residential transaction just, just doesn't happen. Before I came here, uh, I was working for a, a title company that's owned by Black State Real Estate, Blackstone Real Estate Management. Y'all may know as the largest uh, equity manager uh, in the country. All they do is not all they do, but primarily what they do is, is commercial real estate. Uh, they draw in private equity. They form these funds and then they either go out and buy a whole bunch of multifamily properties or retail properties or hospitality or hotel, whatever it may be. <coughs> so in two years of closing those transactions, uh, and these were very large, complicated transactions, I never saw a buyer. I never saw a seller. We could have been working out of a out of an RV in the Walmart parking lot. The title company could have been doing, it, and nobody would have known or cared. Uh, it's it was it's just not unusual for even if the folks are in town, if the parties are in town, they're liable to go to their attorney's office, execute all the documents. They'll email us copies. We'll send a runner over to pick them up, and we're closed. You know, I, I want to echo to that because it's kind of funny. This little transaction I'm working on right now, it has just been emails and messages. That's it. Because um, I am functioning as the intermediary on this thing, and it's nothing but emails and text messages. And and I wanted to ask, I want to back you up just a step. Uh, when you were talking about the lawyers, I, I'm willing to bet that you don't use, like, any 
Trek promulgated forms. Am I correct on that? Like, do you do you see any of those come across your table other than maybe a rudimentary lease or something? Colin, we do. Uh, oddly enough, on most farm and ranch transactions, they'll use the Trek promulgated uh, farm and ranch contract form because it. I mean that that contract form is in my opinion, absolutely wonderful for farm and ranch. It covers everything from grazing ranch or grazing rights that may be out there to farm implements that are to stay. Is the tractor going to stay? But it's all in the contract. I've seen a lot of uh, commercial real estate attorneys representing parties on farm and ranch contracts use the Trek contract, the Trek farm and ranch contract, because it's just so well done. Now, on larger transactions where buyer seller have counsel, we will sometimes see the commercial contract for improved property. That's the TAR, Texas Association of Realtors contract. And sometimes we'll see the unimproved property contract, which is the other Trek uh, promulgated commercial form. Anything of any substance, though, typically we're going to see on an attorney prepared contract form. Now, from the title company standpoint, if, if, if a commercial escrow officer gets a contract in on the commercial contract improved property, which is the TAR, the TAR Association contract, we know where to look. We know where uh, feasibility period is. We know what page it's on. We know if it's in the upper third, middle third, or lower third of the contract. We know seller deliverables we know where to look because we've done enough work with those on the attorney prepared contracts i'll go into a room and lock the door behind me and shut off my phone with a magic marker in my hand and i'll spend an hour with a yellow highlighter reading that contract line for line word for word and it may be a 35 page contract but i've got to understand the critical dates I'm talking from a closing standpoint. All of the important information is hidden. You have to go hunt for it. All of it's important, particularly when it comes to the critical dates. Uh, earnest money has got to be delivered within three days, the effective date of the contract. Sellers got deliverables that have to be delivered within X days of the contract. You just have to go hunt for all of that stuff. Yeah, let me... Let me unpack that just for a quick second, because I, I, I used to be a teacher and I'm real big on, on misunderstood words. So I want to make sure that everybody listening in the future and here now understands what a feasibility period is. Um, it's basically an option period, guys. Um, it's basically runs the same thing as an option period. However, most of the time in commercial contracts, from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's not usually a contract right out the gate. There's usually a letter of intent. Like, hey, we fully anticipate to do this, but it's not really a contract form. And a lot of times the feasibility period will be there or it will come with the contract um, where, hey, and they're usually longer. It's not 10 days like, like a residential contract. It's usually 30 days, 90 days, a year. I mean, they can be very, very long because they want to verify financials. Like if you're buying a Walmart, like I want to know that Walmart's actually paying you and I need to verify all that or strict center or something. Um, they want to make sure that they can retrofit it. So they get contractors out and you know what the costs are going to be and all that stuff. Am I correct on assuming those things? Am, am I speaking correctly here? No, you are. You are Colin. It's it, typically, I think a commercial transaction starts off with a letter of intent. That's going to break out the, the basic terms of the sale. It's going to identify the sales price the parties have agreed to sell for and, and to pay. It's going to identify whether or not there's any financing to be involved. Uh, if so, if there are any, any conditions, it's going to verify what's to be conveyed, uh, both real property and personal property. So the letter of intent is going to set out the basic skeleton, the basic agreement of the contract. Once the parties are signed off on that, then they'll have, let's use the attorneys, then the attorneys will begin preparing the contract based upon the letter of intent. So we've got the big things agreed to. The feasibility period typically, I'm not going to say typically, I'll say always is going to be, it may be set out in the letter of intent. And by the way, the title company seldom sees the letter of intent, uh, but it will always be set out in the contract. It's either going to be, and it's going to be set out very clearly in the contract because the effective date of the contract is what begins the clock ticking for every other event, every subsequent event that has to occur within a specified time frame. 
uh, where either one or both parties have to perform a certain act. The uh, letter of intent, again, let me back up. The contract is going to contain the language that says this contract represents the entire agreement between the parties. There are no oral agreements that can be enforced. A letter of intent is not going to say that. It's a proposal. We kind of intend to buy this property if we can agree to these basic conditions. The contract is going to absolutely tie you to the conditions. And particularly if you're rep representing a seller, you want to make sure that the seller has agreed to provide items to the purchaser that the seller has. I'll give you an example. I had a closing a couple of years ago where the, the seller apparently made the statement to his attorney and to his realtor. Uh, I have copies of the as-built plans of this building. Well, the seller's attorney and the seller's realtor said, good. You mind giving them up to the buyer? Nope, happy to do it. Well, to the buyer, that was a very important piece of information to have. It turned out the seller did not have a copy of the as-built floor plans of that building. Now, the deal did not fall through, but it became an opportunity for the buyer to renegotiate a number of items with the seller that the seller would not have had to endure had he had a copy of the as-built floor plans. So my point is that contract is going to contain a ton of information the seller has to deliver. And if you're representing the seller, make sure the seller's got that. Make sure they can readily lay their hands on it and can provide it to the buyer within the time frame specified in the contract. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I might even take it a step further. Get, gather that information. When they say they have something, get it from them. I uh, would create your own create your own file folder, guys. Don't, I don't wait for anybody. You know how this goes. I would agree with that entirely. Any information that the seller's got on hand that they've had for a while to pertain to the property, uh, yes, I would get that up front. Uh, and look at it yourself to make sure that you can commit to the seller delivering that particular piece of property. Romy, real quick, um, I know we were talking about critical dates. Do you, um, at some point, you know, I, I want to mention that critical dates wheel and be able to provide those to the group. Uh, there, man, I wish, I wish. I'm gonna uh, I've got one. Oh, you got one? You guys are going to love this. Now, I told y'all when I got in this business, how many years ago it was, and, and I'll let you do the math. This is what we used 48 years ago. It's not automated. It's not a calculator. It's a, like wheel, attached, a wheel attached to a wheel. And by using this thing, you can, if, you, if you're involved in a contract that says the effective date is three days after the title company's receipt of the earnest money. Well, you can look at, now that one's easy. I mean, we all have 10 fingers, so we can count to three pretty well. But then the contract says uh, within X days after the receipt date of the earnest money, seller will provide the following. Well, if it's 45 days, instead of having to count on your fingers or try to find a paper calendar, which hardly nobody has anymore, you got the handy dandy wheel. So you count off 45 days from whatever that date is. <clears throat> Believe it or not, we have I, not found we have not found an automated program that you can get on the internet, either free or or at a cost, that will calculate critical dates for you. Oh, I cheat! Oh, I got a, I got a little cheat for you. Just ask Siri. Siri, how many? I'm Siri. Like it works every time. Why, Siri? How many is 45 days from today? Check your wheel. Oh. What date is 45 days from today? March 4th. Is that correct? Um, Sounds about right. It might be. I'm, I'm still learning how to use this thing. Wheels are tricky. I'm just glad that, you know, Romy had wheels back when he started. So that's good. Right. But no, I do. I do like the thing. And I do want to point out that just, just another thing that I've noticed and correct me if I'm wrong again, is that commercial contracts take a lot longer. You very seldomly close a commercial deal in 30 days. Or 45 days. Wait, or whatever what day we do did you say? Sorry, Colin, what'd you say? I think I said March 4th. I don't know. Yes, you're right. right. So, yeah, yeah, there's a quick cheat. I learned how to use it. Yes. <laughs>
but uh, they take a lot longer. And some of these feasibility periods, earnest money things, they're not 10 days. It's not three days. It's, it's 45 days or 90 days. I, I've, I've worked on a couple of them and I'm like, how am I going to remember all this? Because it is like, because as, as the broker, you're just sitting there for 90 days while they look at stuff. And you better remember because come day about 85, you want to start being on everybody's butt. So it is a, a good thing to remember when it comes out, those longer transactions. It is particularly on the longer on, on the larger transactions. It is exceedingly rare for us to close one of those transactions within ninety days of the effective date of the contract. Very do y'all rare. do y'all as the title company still abide by like how many? On, on, is there any difference in a commercial contract with how many days you have to provide a commitment? Uh, I'm sorry. Ask your question again. I'm not sure I understood. So with a residential transaction, it says 20 days after the effective date of this contract that the title company must provide a title commitment of some sort. Or do you all have similar restrictions? Uh, is there similar expectations in a commercial contract for you all to provide a title commitment? Colin, it's, it is all negotiable. It is all it. negotiable. The, uh, the only thing that I would point out is typically the parties are uh, sophisticated enough to know that you have to, for example, the delivery of the title insurance commitment. Uh, if it's a commercial transaction in Zavala County down south, we can't bang that commitment out in four days. That's going to be three weeks. And normally the buyer and seller will understand, all right, we're not in a metropolitan county. Things are done a little differently. It's going to take a little bit longer. So you gotta all go of it's, off the clerk. <laughs> yeah. All of it is negotiable. Every date in a commercial contract, whether it's a promulgated form, pre-printed, or an attorney form, every date is uh, negotiated. And typically, I think what happens, Colin, is buyer's attorney says to seller's attorney, okay, we need this from the seller. What's a reasonable time for the seller to provide it? I think I, I, think I can have it to you in 45 days. Great, let's use 45 days. It is all negotiable. But I've also seen commercial transactions that can take nine years, or pardon me, nine months to a year to close. And while we're talking about that, and again, this is observation from a title company. This is not a, the right or wrong way to do things. I've been involved in commercial transactions where the real estate broker gets the contract signed by the parties. They send it over to the title company. They confirm the earnest money got deposited within the proper number of days. And we've got a nine month close. Everybody knows we're gonna be closing at the end of nine months. I don't hear anything out of that broker again until the Tuesday before the Friday closing. And I get the phone call and says, Romy, I understand from my client, we're gonna close Friday, is that right? Yeah, John, that's my understanding, Friday's it. Great, you want me to send you my wiring instructions? John, send them on over. I don't hear anything, it's quiet. Now, I don't know what John's doing in the background as far as working with his client, staying on top of the transaction. I'm just telling you from a title company standpoint, it's crickets until we're very close to closing. I've also closed transactions where the broker is deeply, deeply involved in the transaction. I used to close uh, a lot of multifamily deals for a California investor and his local guy was named Bob. I'm just going to say Bob because that was his name. Bob was the kind of broker that I talked to him one day. I said, Bob, you sound upset. What's wrong? He said, I've been trying to get to a cap rate using the three different me methods and I can't get it. I can't get the cap rate to match. I said, Bob, what's the problem? He said, well, I'm trying to carry it out three decimal points. And I always come up with a different third decimal point. How many investors care about the cap rate coming out, whether it's 10.8376 or 10.8 but for bob it had to be 10.8376 on the button all the way through he was very involved in transactions he was <coughs> on the phone weekly looking for updates uh i mean he was seriously a part of the transaction i'm not saying which way is right or wrong i'm just saying that if you get on a commercial transaction and you get the contract signed and the, the realtor on the other side of the transaction goes crickets on you, don't be surprised. I mean, you don't know what they're, what conversations they're having with their client, but you may not hear from them 
until we're getting ready so, to put. With that being said, what are some of the things that the white line agents could do to help you along or, or what, what are some attributes that you would like to see from an agent? Now, me personally, if you leave me alone, as long as you get me what I need in a quick period of time, I don't need to talk to you once a day. Um, but what, what would you say are some attributes or some things that we should be looking for as agents when it comes to dealing with a title company or requesting information or how can we be most helpful and productive? You know, I, I think probably the most important thing, most helpful thing y'all can do for us, Colin, is to advise us on how to speak with your client. Do, does Let's say you've got the seller in a transaction. Does the seller want to hear from the title company or does the seller want to hear from you? Or does the seller want to hear from his attorney? So I think one of the best things that y'all can do is let us know how to approach your client in a manner that your client's going to be most comfortable and most satisfied with. Some sellers have no interest in talking to the title company. We're like a gas station. All they want is for the services to be produced, for the car to get clean, to make sure it's topped off with oil and gas so they can drive it off. That's all they want. Uh, you can tell us about your client. You can be involved, certainly, uh, when we send out the critical dates letter, if we can call you and say, look, we've got to have copies of estoppel certificates within 75 days. Do you want us to go directly to the seller, seller's counsel, or do we want you, do you want us to come to you? Those kind of directions and instructions can help us a ton trying to get to a closing. Make sense? Gotcha. So find the, find the most efficient way to communicate and, and communicate that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, any information you can share about your client uh, that's going to help us help your client and you get to the closing table, that's always going to be helpful to us. I mean, the personal side of this, granted, there's not much emotion involved in the commercial transaction, but it's still people and it's still relationships and you're still having conversations and communication and folks have different likes and dislikes. And we certainly don't want to uh, cause you a problem with your client. Because in your client's eyes, we've either overstepped our bounds or we've approached them in a manner in which they'd rather not be approached. So we, we've talked about some of the pros of doing the commercial stuff, which that honestly is very attractive to me. Um, I don't like dealing with emotional people. That's why I work primarily with investors. It's all just numbers and cents. And I, I can't have you flip-flopping because you do or don't like the color of the granite in the kitchen. Like, I can't deal with that. You don't like um, people crying at you? Uh, I don't. I, I, I just... I, I, I don't know if I'm just turning into a grumpy old man or what, but I'm just like, I'm done. I, I don't care. But what are, what are some of the cons or the pitfalls or, or, or just what, what should we be aware of if we're like, Hey man, I'm going to start doing more commercial because I mean, guys, you can, um, what, what are some of the things that we need to look out for or, or at least be aware of? Colin, I, I don't think there's, I really don't think there's any downside to, getting into the commercial business. If you can, and again, I'm, I'm gonna speak from my side of it. Uh, a lot of times, particularly with commercial brokers that maybe don't have a lot of experience, the, large, the, more, not, the more zeros there are in the sales price, the more they get concerned or uh, maybe lose a little edge of self-confidence. Uh, maybe, uh, I'm not, I'm not even going to go where that is. I guess all I would say is a real estate transaction is a real estate transaction. It doesn't care if it's, it doesn't matter if it's commercial or if it's residential. It's the same basic functions. You've got different types of players, different types of attorneys, different types of lenders, but it's still a real estate transaction. So for heaven's sake, don't be afraid of a commercial transaction. Don't, don't be afraid to jump into a commercial transaction. There's, if nothing else, if you're, and I'm going to tout the title company's role here a little bit. If you're dealing with somebody at a title company who is well experienced, well versed in commercial transactions, they can be your, your best buddy. They can take you by the hand and say, look, here's what you need to expect. Here's what you need to anticipate. Here's what you need to be thinking about getting your hands on quickly. Let us help guide you through the transaction. Now we do the same thing on residential obviously, but on commercial, sometimes it's a little more technical. Sometimes you have to gather information up that you may not be used to gathering up. 
Yeah, I just I just realized a definition that I kind of glossed over a little bit at the beginning that I want to make sure everybody fully understands. The word commercial. Um, everybody thinks they understand what that means. Guys, it just means income generating. That for, for all intents and purposes, what that fo- focuses down to in Trek size is anything that's five units or bigger, right? So keep that in mind. So anything of the fourplex or less, guys, you, you can use the standard one to four family contract, right? Once you get above four, it falls into the commercial realm. And then plus anything that is income generating, like store, strip centers, land, farm and ranch, right? Anything that generates income for the specific purpose of generating income. Uh, some of them, you know, like a duplex, if you live in one half, yes, you can make money on it, but you know, it's not, you're, you're living there. Right. And, and so it's still considered commercial, but yeah, just so y'all understand it's it, all, it commercial means a lot. Um, go ahead. Oh, I mean, I was just going to say, you were saying, you know, any negatives and, and it's just in Romy, you can elaborate on this, but it's just that these take longer to close usually. And so with residential, you know, it's typically a a quicker turnaround. So I think um, just knowing going in that these transactions can take months to year or, you know, just depending on the scale is just something to be aware of. You know, that, that brings up another, well, two points, actually, Colin, that I mean, Kath, Kathleen's exactly exactly right. Uh, what I would call successful commercial brokers in San Antonio that that I've done business with in the past or do business with now, if they close three to five transactions a year, that's a heavy year. That's a lot of work. Just three to five transactions a year. Now, if you're if you've got a ten million dollar sale and you've negotiated a two percent commission. That's two hundred thousand dollars. So maybe you don't have to have just a whole bunch of transactions when you've got that kind of earnings coming in. But it's very unusual for no. Let me let me rephrase that. It's not uncommon to see commercial brokers closing very few numbers of transactions per year. And remember, none of these go on MLS, so nobody really knows how much anybody's doing because it's just not reported. And the other thing that I would say, pick your target. The guys that I know and gals that are really successful on the commercial side, you know, there's that old saying, do one thing and do it very, very well, do it better than anybody else. I, I, I know brokers who only do multifamily. They know the multifamily market in San Antonio and Bear County, as well as anybody in the country. They don't have a clue about retail. They don't have a clue about hospitality. They don't have a clue about raw land, but they know multifamily. There are guys in the community who only deal in land. Uh, That's all they do is raw land. If you put a strip center on them, an income producing strip center, and ask them to figure out how to get that thing sold and closed, they wouldn't have a clue. That's not their expertise. The guys that I know that are very, very successful in farm and ranch, they do farm and ranch. They do it very, very well, but it's all that they do. That's their specialty. That's what they specialize in. So maybe unlike residential, I think it might be beneficial. If if I were a realtor, <coughs> pardon me, contemplating getting into commercial, I'd want to pick my market. And I'd want to pick a market that's got sustainability, that's going to be around for a while. Uh, I would not want to get into land today. Nobody's doing buy and hold land anymore. Developers aren't buying land anymore. Yeah, I say that. It's slowed down because the builders don't want to get tied up with the expense of any more lots that they have to take down and build homes on when they can't sell the homes they've got. So... I would suggest you kind of figure out what you really like, what really attracts you as a market segment and then chase that. Yeah, and and guys, I, I've, I've talked to you all about this in the past and, and you know, the whole purpose <laughs> of White Line was to be investor friendly and that's naturally migrated me to working with investors. So the reason for my personal interest in this is, you know, I own, you know, a couple duplexes, fourplex, sixplex, 
I want to get into this 8, 20, 30, 40, whatever units beyond that. And I want to be able to help investors that want to do that. Uh, I've been talking to more and more of them as the, the years go on and all this stuff. So guys, if it, he's right. Find your niche. My niche is investors. And, you know, and I've expanded my niche into, you know, single families all day long into duplexes into this, into that, as we go further and further. So that that's the purpose of this guy. So it doesn't mean that you have, I, I 100% agree with Romy. You can't know everything there is to know about everything. Uh, like I said at the beginning of this, I know just enough in commercial to be dangerous. It's, it's like a monkey with a loaded gun. That, that's how I feel. But when I, when I talk commercial with people, it's like, I know what button to push, but I'm not sure about aiming. So um, getting more information is going to be, you know, really crucial in where you want your career to go. Right. Uh, if you want to just work solely with uh, residential people and like, that's what you want to do by all means. Great. I'm glad you're here because now you know somebody that can get you the answers or if you need to, if you need to pivot and say, Hey, look, we're going to hand this thing off. But I, I promised everybody we'd be right at an hour. So we got about 15 minutes left. Does anybody have any questions that they want to ask the experts here while we're here? Cause I have a feeling Hillary does, but she's muted and invisible to me. And Israel usually asks some good questions. Hillary, you got anything for him? I honestly, I don't, I've just been taking some notes, but I, um, it's been good information so far. I really do like the aspect of it's not really an emotional uh, component. Cause that is one thing that I know Colin and I've talked about. I, I don't like that either. And so I've kind of been pulling back a little bit as an agent or I'm also a broker, but I, uh, I don't like dealing with people <laughs> it turns out. So well, that are yeah highly emotional and crying and so yeah. you, right like that that takes its toll on you it does and so I feel like I've pulled back a little bit um just in like the brokerage stuff uh, my husband and I are also investors and we have all multifamilies at this point um so that's kind of the direction we're already going anyway um in terms of you know residential multifamily um but yeah I think the commercial side will just be really interesting to get into more uh, that has nothing to do with residential. Right. Well, you know, and the other thing that I, I, I again, correct me if I'm wrong on this, <laughs> Romy and Kathleen, like real estate, like traditional real estate deals or single families, they tend to fall apart at an exponentially higher level than commercial dues do. So like if a commercial guy puts a letter of intent, I mean, I think, it, correct, I mean, 95, 99% of the time it is closed if they put a letter of intent on it. You know, I, I can't say the same for um, residential stuff. Like, you know, I, I changed my mind or I went and bought a car and now my financing fell apart or, you know, whatever. And, and so the, these things can fall apart, which are a little bit nerve wracking. But that, am I right on that? Yes, that I'll, I'll, I'll share this with you, which may be kind of shocking. In a, this is historically, in a strong residential market, which we are not in a strong residential market now. Don't know when we're going to be again, but we're certainly not there today. But 18 months ago, when the market was hot, prices were going up, not enough buyers, or too many buyers, not enough sellers. The fallout rate for title companies in Texas, the average was 35%. So out of every 100 contracts we took in, 65 of those would close. 35 would fall out. Either buyer didn't qualify, uh, inspection problems with real property, appraisal problems, something would come up, buyer just changed their mind and walked away and left $1,000 earnest money in the type of whatever it was. So that's 35% fallout in a good market. I think it's probably a little higher now, uh, the fallout rate, because uh, it's just much more difficult to get financing. And the yeah, lenders are much tougher. It, I, I'm I don't get me started on lenders right now. Like I'm fighting with about three banks. Um, they're all a little frustrating. All right, anybody else got any questions? Bernice, Israel, Tanner. Yeah, I've got. I, I've got uh, a I have a quick question. Oh, go ahead, Israel. Uh, no, go right ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Well, so we are um, most likely going to list a eight unit property, and this may not be a question for title, but more so for Colin. Like, is that, would we just list that as like a multifamily? Yeah. As opposed to yeah. So how many, how many units? I'm sorry, I missed that. Um, It's eight units and a single family home on the property. 
So yeah, most MLSs, thing. I know y'all are in Houston, so I'm assuming mm -hmm. the matrix that y'all use will allow for eight individual, um, like you can put in the eight units and, you know, how many bedrooms and all that kind of stuff is. I think they go up to about eight and I, that's usually where they cut it off. So yes, you can list it in the MLS. Um, in, As a multifamily? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. That's I wanted I want. to interject really quick and just say mm -hmm. that uh, our commercial services team can service the entire state of Texas. Okay. Your your you office go. university title. I live in the woodlands. It's mm -hmm. actually like five minutes from my house. Yeah, there we I do have a location the there as well. Yeah, good. Yeah. Those are good folks in that office. Oh, good. Good to know. But so they do residential too. Yes. Sure. Okay. Good to know. Plus, on that eight unit, I mean, I, it, it might behoove you to find somebody who does a little bit more commercial because it's going to be a different kind of transaction. Um, mm -hmm. that, you know, all that cap rate conversation, all those kind of stuff. It, it's going to be a financial decision, not a, oh, I like it because it's blue, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you're going to want to make sure you, that you find somebody with some commercial experience. So definitely look into these guys. All yeah. right, Israel, what's your question? Uh, yes. Uh, so I work also with foreign nationals. Uh, and on regards to commercial, I do get that question a lot. Uh, as far as from people from Mexico, if they're wanting to buy commercial real estate out here, uh, mainly cash, do they have, I mean, what, what are the requirements? I mean, as far as IDs, can you guys close them in Mexico? I mean, I don't know how that works as far as the commercial side. Well, typically, Israel, that's a great question. Uh, typically, uh, we'll accept a passport, uh, a driver's license or, or ID uh, issued by the province or state. Let's say that it's, it's someone from uh, Leon. They're going to have probably a driver's license issued by the state or some type of ID. They won't accept that. They don't, they don't have to have Texas ID. Uh, the ID from their, from their home country is going to be sufficient. One and, and the reason I'm really glad that you brought that up, because uh, this is a problem that I've faced for years in San Antonio. I'm pretty good at what I do, and I've done it for a pretty long time. Uh, so I'm pretty confident and comfortable in, in my abilities when it comes to closing a commercial transaction. But one thing that I can't necessarily do is relate to someone coming out of Monterey who is uh, a Mexican national, a wealthy Mexican national, wants to buy commercial property in San Antonio. I don't speak the language. I don't have the cultural nuances. I don't have the cultural connection with that individual. Uh, and I never will. But fortunately here in San Antonio, we've got a lady named Judy Jurgi, who, who's bilingual. She's as comfortable in Spanish as she is in English. And she's got all of those cultural nuances, those traits that are so common in Mexico and common within Mexican society that are not necessarily so in Texas or in the United States. So I would really encourage you, if you've got folks that are coming in from Mexico, whether they're buying or they're going to be selling property or whatever, uh, I would encourage you to consider Judy in our office. Kathleen can send you all of her information. I was just about to say that, Romy. I would love to create an introduction to Judy. Um, she has over 20 years of closing experience in residential and commercial. Just like Romy said, she's bilingual. She's strong. She's confident. She's she's incredible. So she's she's such an asset to our team. Great. Yeah, if you can send me that information, it would be great. Absolutely. I'll get Colin, Thank we'll you. get your email and phone and all that. And I'll, I'll make that happen. Colin, yeah, and I was going to say, I was going to say, and, and a lot of times, and, and I might be wrong on this too, but when you're buying commercial property, you're typically not buying it in your own name. Um, you're probably buying it in some sort of company mm -hmm. uh, just for liability standpoints, anything like that. Like I would strongly recommend like Somebody like, oh, hey, Colin Corrine is going to go buy this strip center. No, you're not. You need to open some sort of LLC because something will happen. Uh, so more than likely, they're going to have some corporation that's going to have to be validated through the United States somehow, somewhere, whatever it is. So that would be probably my 
first thing is I had asked is like, are you individually buying this or are you going to be buying it through some sort of company? Um, Which a real just, estate attorney could set up an LLC. Yeah. Sounds great. Correct. Right. Got you. All right. Now, before we go, uh, we got what? Five minutes. Kathleen, what, Kathleen, you're in charge of this. Tell us again why university title is the best and why we should send all of our business to you. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are a lot of title companies out there. Um, there are fewer that do commercial and do commercial well. Um, we are blessed with uh, the fact that we have seven strong closers. And again, you know, four that really focus on commercial. And, you know, Romy and I say this all the time. The difference between, and I will, Romy and I have, we discuss this all the time. We're never going to talk trash about any other title companies. That's not what we're about. But what we can say is what we can do, which is be thorough. We dot our I's, we cross our T's. When Romy says he gets a contract with a highlighter, that's no joke. Literally, line by line. And so if we can eliminate any frustration, headaches, delays, if we can communicate well, that is our ultimate goal is to create a clean title experience for you and your closers. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to brag on Romy. We have a man on our team that has 48 years of title experience. He is a wealth of knowledge. He has seen whether he won't toot his own horn, but I can, he has seen probably every situation that can and will come up in a transaction and he's seen it dealt with it addressed it and so we have him and so we we you know i like to call him oz behind the magic curtain he we we also you know he's player coach role for us um but you know he's here for us and again i'm i've got my cell phone on me 24 7 if you need communication you text me you call me if i can't answer it i'm going to call romy we all work together as a team so that we can be a, a value to you. That's our goal. Let, let, let me piggyback on that real quick. And and I'm sorry if I'm I'm probably taking a little bit of your thunder from you, no, but no, no. Like, guys, they're, they cannot charge any more or less for title insurance, okay? Title insurance costs what title insurance costs. It is regulated by the state. It doesn't matter what title company you go to, it's gonna be the same. So a lot of people are like, well, why is this title company cheaper than that one? Well, they do charge something called an escrow fee which you can beat them up on that. I, I've seen them anywhere from $200 to $800 a side. So the buyer and the seller are paying two to $800, depending on the title company. What I have learned, uh, you can negotiate that. and But I will say you tend to get what you pay for. Um, so heads up on that. You can always ask what title fees are. They tend to change for transactions. I'm not going to hold these guys to their feet to the fire on that right now. But what they can offer is service. Um, that is the only thing that they can truly do to be different. They can't buy us. They can't, you know, we're almost a few hundred dollar gift. They can't do that. They can't change the pricing. They can't do any of this stuff. So they're going to, they're going to send you on service. Like that's what they're going to sell you on because that's all they can really change. I think it's very interesting, uh, that she offered her cell phone number right here, right now, ladies and gentlemen, when I offer lo loan originators, I tell them, I was like, here's the guy's cell phone number. You can call him. Um, so that's always a really big thing with me, guys. So it's something to consider. Like if I can call somebody and get a hold of them versus press seven, press six, now what, leave a message at the tone. We'll call you back in six to nine years. You know, that kind of crap gets real old with me. Um, so just something for y'all to consider. Like the service is where it comes from and experience. And if you got somebody that can hunt down problems and you got somebody that's going to answer your calls, I think that's very, very important and something that you should definitely well, consider. And do we have any time for Romy to discuss any, like, our underwriters we use? Or that can be another conversation, but, um, you know, Romy, do you have anything to add quickly in conclusion? No, no I, I, I think probably the best advice I can give all of y'all is use your title company as a resource. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use me, for example, if Colin, if you've got a question on a commercial property that you've just listed that may have some wrinkles to it, or, or you just have some concerns about it, pick up the phone and call me and say, look, Romy, this is a, this is a former gas station. Uh, it has been vacant for five years. We had 
probate problems, they couldn't be sold, the property was tied up in the estate, whatever it may be. What do I need to be worried about on, on a gas station? Well, first you need to be worried about gas tanks. Uh, those are probably going to have to be removed. How much remediations are going to be involved? Then you need to worry about battery storage. Was there any batteries? Do you have to go get an environmental uh, letter? Well, yeah, you're going to have to get at least a level one. Use your title company for a resource so you have as much information in your back pocket always that you can possibly have. Uh, I, all too often we see situations come up that where a deal will start wiggling on us or trying to go south simply because somebody didn't ask a question and they could ask it 30 days ago and gotten the answer and gotten the parties prepared but they were either afraid to ask the question they didn't know to ask the question or they didn't know who they should ask the question uh, so I would just encourage you, man, get a relationship with your title company, with your closer, make sure you, you got a good closer, oh, competent closer. And I'm going to, I'm going to echo tell. that guys. I'm going to echo that. I used to teach and I had a rule in my classroom that there is such a thing as a stupid question. And they tend to start with the words, what if as adults, it's kind of the same thing, but it, as for us, the only stupid question is the one that's not asked. So if you need to ask it, ask it. And I'd rather like pester them. To, to no end uh, because your transaction needs to go smoothly and it's going to make you look like an expert. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of y'all think I'm, you know, you call me with questions and all this stuff. And the only reason I know it's because I've tripped over it before, <laughs> or I know the person who knows it. Yeah. Right. So it, it's the same with these guys in 48 years or 58. I don't know how long Romy you've been doing this, but I know you're impressed that you found a wheel. So that's good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, guys, well, thank you. I'm going to let y'all go. Um, I appreciate your time and wonderful guys reach out to them. I'll, I'll, when I send out this video guys, I'll, I'll add all the information, the, the websites, all that kind of stuff. So you'll get their information from me. Guys. Thank you so much. We thank appreciate you. your time and we are here. Please reach out. We would love to work with y'all and uh, we're just thrilled to make this introduction. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you guys thank for you your so time. Right, thanks, thanks, John. Thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Bye-bye.